My name is Chris Jones and I'm Editor-in-Chief of ACS Catalysis and I'm pleased to announce the winner of the 2015 ACS Catalysis Lectureship for the Advancement of Catalytic Science are Morris Bullock and Dan Dubois of the Pacific Northwest National Lab representing the PNNL Hydrogen Catalysis Team. They are being honored for their breakthroughs in the understanding of the role of proton movement in the electrocatalytic interconversion of electricity and hydrogen fuel. They did this using a family of synthetic catalysts that utilize pendant amines to relay protons between the nickel active site and the bulk solution. The beneficial role of the proton relay is manifested in the unprecedented catalytic activity of these complexes, which are capable of producing hydrogen faster than the di-iron hydrogenase enzymes from which they were inspired. Congratulations, Morris and Dan, on the award. Thanks very much. It's a wonderful honor for our entire team. Thank you. It is an honor. So, Dan and Morris, please help me understand your interest in the uh, nickel complexes that you studied, and more specifically, uh, what inspired you to begin working on this system? The genesis of the nickel P2 uh, N2 complexes actually was, comes from an inspiration from hydrogenase enzyme in which the iron-iron hydrogenase enzyme has a uh, iron center that has a vacant coordination site and a P2 N2 uh, ligand or an in, a pendant amine that comes in and can interact with hydrogen or hydride ligand on the iron to help facilitate hydrogen bond cleavage or hydrogen bonding. And so really it was the structure of the active site of the iron-iron hydrogenase enzyme that sort of motivated uh, our initial studies. So in 2003, we published a, by we, I mean uh, my wife Mary and I, uh, who was a collaborator, um, published a paper on nickel complexes that contain what we call a PNP ligand that had simply one pendant amine per, per diphosphine ligand. Uh, those complexes were catalysts for hydrogen oxidation, but they were relatively slow. So after much discussion, we uh, decided that what we needed to do was position one of the pendant amines so that it would be very close to hydrogen when it bound to the metal center. And when we did that, uh, we found that the activity increased by several orders of magnitude and our overpotentials actually went down. So that was a very nice uh, uh, indication that the structures of the enzyme were providing us with real information on how to, to design our catalyst. So the nickel PNP complexes came first, but the P2N2 that had this position to be uh, were second, and that was published in Jackson in 2006. About that time, Mary and I moved to Pacific Northwest uh, National Lab, and about six months after that, Morris joined us, uh, uh, and the rest of the story is sort of history from there. Uh, Dan mentioned uh, in some ways that the catalysts were inspired by uh, enzymatic systems, natural systems. Uh, Morris, can you uh, go into a little more detail about how your catalysts are inspired by such systems? We try to develop functional models in our research, and what I mean by functional models is that we're trying to replicate the function of iron-iron hydrogenase enzymes. We're not aimed at structural models. There's a lot of terrific work going on by many groups around the world trying to duplicate the structure of the iron hydrogenase enzyme. We're Focus more on just the function of it, and, and by that what I mean is that we look at the what is known about the structure of the enzyme from protein crystallography. It has an earth abundant metal, iron or nickel, and it has a pendant amine, as Dan mentioned, uh, positioned correctly to interact with hydrogen. So what we're trying to do is to focus in on how to develop uh, synthetic molecules that replicate the function of the hydrogenase enzyme by having an earth abundant metal like nickel positioning the pendant amine and looking at each step of the reaction pathway to try to optimize each step independently and, and overall to get a good uh, free energy of the overall reaction. Dan, back to you. Uh, previously, we talked about the nickel complex, the P2N2 ligand. Uh, more recently, your team has begun to explore other metals, including iron, cobalt, manganese. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about the, the breadth of the uh, catalytic complexes that your team has explored? Uh, yes, uh, the overarching issue with uh, trying to design uh, metal catalysts for uh, hydrogen oxidation or production is trying to avoid either very high energy or very uh, low energy uh, intermediates. For example, in the oxidation of hydrogen, you have to bind hydrogen and you have to cleave it. And so if you consider just the latter step, 
one thing that's very important is the matching of the hydride acceptability of the iron with the basicity, if you will, of the uh, pendinamine. You can put those two things closely together, as I talked about with the uh, nickel complexes, uh, but if the energies are not matched, the reaction simply will not work in the way that you want it to. So you can use this energy matching of the hydride acceptability and the proton accept of the metal center and the proton acceptability of the uh, pin and amine to design the catalyst to be either hydrogen production catalyst or hydrogen oxidation catalyst. For a hydrogen production catalyst, what you want is the free energy for hydrogen addition to be negative so that hydrogen addition is, is favored. So those catalysts that have uh, a favorable hydrogen addition energy, those will be biased towards hydrogen oxidation. Those that are unfavorable for hydrogen bonding will be biased towards uh, hydrogen production. Now ideally what you would like to have is catalysts that can go both ways because those will be the most energy efficient. And the hydrogenase enzymes, many of them can go both ways. We have also designed metal complexes that can go both ways. But by using these principles of energy matching, the hydride acceptability and the proton acceptability, and also having the right structural aspects, that is a vacant coordination site adjacent to a position pendant amine, you can use this general principle to design iron, cobalt, nickel, manganese, uh, we've done molybdenum, uh, various different kinds of metals. And then the problem then reduces to synthetic issues about how do you make the complexes you, you want that have the right hydride donor ability or hydride acceptor ability and the right pKa of the pin and amine. But the general underlying principle is, is the same. You need to control the thermodynamics of all the steps and you need to give it this physical pathway. So Morris, this work clearly resulted from the close interaction of a team of researchers. Could you comment on the importance of team-based science today? That's a great point, Chris, and it's been integral to the success that our center has had to have a, a team of researchers working closely together. We need to assemble a team of, of scientists that have complementary expertise. And in particular, Dan and I, for the most part, are experimental scientists, and we've benefited enormously from a close collaboration with theoretical and computational chemists, in particular from, from our center, with Simone Roger, Michelle Dupuy, and Sharon Ham Schiffer. And even within the experimental group that we have, we need a variety of expertise, such as synthesis, spectroscopy, kinetics, and mechanisms. And all of those have contributed to the success that we've had to have people that have expertise in, in different areas of that sort. It's important not just to have a team that has the expertise, but have people that genuinely want to work together and that see the benefit of, of working together in a team. And that can lead to, to enhanced progress. And part of that has to do with uh, being comfortable working with the, with the colleagues that we have and not being afraid to be shown to be wrong. We, we all know that we've had many times when we're not thinking about something correctly and yet having a team approach helps us to move more quickly and figure out what we're not doing right or what we're not thinking about right and having that kind of, of group to uh, propel our research along has been very beneficial for us. Morris and Dan, your award represents two firsts for the journal. Uh, you're the first team to, to win the ACS Catalysis Lectureship. And also, you're the first National Lab scientist to be honored with this particular award. Um, quite often, students ask me about the opportunities available uh, associated with a career at a DOE National Laboratory. So, Morris, could you say a little bit about the, uh, the challenges and the opportunities of working at a national laboratory? The type of research that we do in our center is similar in many ways to the type of research that's done in academic research uh, groups in that we're studying fundamental problems that are related to energy. And this, this type of approach that we have is trying to understand how to design and develop molecular catalysts, looking at every step of the reaction, trying to understand the, the kinetics and the thermodynamics. There are colleagues at, at, at Pacific Northwest and other national labs that work on much more applied projects, and, and some of our colleagues work on very applied projects, sometimes with industrial partners. So part of the idea of, of being successful at a national lab is to be able to identify important problems that, uh, that respond to calls for proposal and to look at the, the, the funding uh, opportunities that may come up, uh, generally in, uh, in energy science. 
And an important point that I want to emphasize is that the research that we've been doing has been supported for a long time by the Department of Energy, and these energy problems that we're focused on are not going to be solved in a traditional three-year funding cycle, and so we're really grateful to the Department of Energy for having the long-term funding that's allowed us to explore these issues and to, to make some progress on them. Uh, now I'd like to move back to your personal beginnings in chemistry. How did you get excited about uh, chemistry and how did you choose to become a chemist and how ultimately did you become a chemist who's uh, focusing in part at least on catalysis? Um, I was nine years old when uh, Sputnik was launched and that dates me very much. But uh, at that time there was a tremendous shift in uh, interest in the country towards scientific and, and technical issues. Um, so that was certainly a major event that influenced me. I had uh, excellent uh, high school and college and uh, graduate school, school uh, teachers and also excellent uh, postdoctoral uh, uh, advisors. Uh, so this, this all contributed uh, very much. I also have two brothers who are inorganic chemists, which uh, influenced me uh, in, in becoming an inorganic chemist. Uh, my wife is an inorganic chemist, so I have been surrounded by inorganic chemists, I guess. I've also had the good fortune to uh, work with a number of colleagues uh, at uh, NREL and at PNNL uh, who have made this whole experience a lot of fun. Similar to Dan, I've had a terrific experience as far as having wonderful mentors in graduate school and, and in my postdoc and uh, also in the national lab environment, both in my years at Brookhaven, interacting closely with some of the, the scientists there, and certainly after I moved to Pacific Northwest, uh, to working closely with Dan and, and the group that is uh, developed in, in the Center for Molecular Electrocatalysis. Uh, Dan and Morris, as we're considering uh, where this, this subfield of catalysis will move in the future, do you see uh, grand challenges or great opportunities that might be just over the horizon that you're excited about tackling? Yes. The um, integration of different disciplines into catalysis has been a very important development, I think, in the last 10 or so years. Uh, theory has come uh, to play a major role. Uh, the calculations are now uh, very good and sometimes rival those of uh, experimentalists in terms of their accuracy. Uh, the studies of enzymes, uh, traditionally uh, when I was first starting in catalysis, um, uh, an x-ray structure of an enzyme was very rare. Uh, now there are many uh, just of the hydrogenase catalyst alone and these provide many structural details and, and pieces of information that are very important uh, for uh, developing catalysts uh, in the future. Uh, electrochemistry is another area. It used to be just for the specialists because of the instrumentation and, and various aspects of it, uh, but now it certainly can be integrated into uh, catalytic studies or many other uh, kinds of studies. So I think in the future you're going to see uh, areas where you see a lot of integration between, as I was saying, theory, biochemistry, electrochemistry, synthetic chemistry, all come together to play uh, important roles in, in catalysis. So uh, with regard to key advances in the areas of uh, catalysis, I will speak mostly for electrocatalysis because that is what I'm most knowledgeable about. But um, there uh, in our area, one of the things that we do see is sort of, and we hope we have helped contribute to, is being able to control proton movement from the level of, let's say, a tenth of an angstrom to a tenth of a millimeter. So this is over seven or eight orders of magnitude in distance scale. But being able to pro provide control over that kind of range of scales is very important if you're going to have very efficient fuel cells or electrolysis cells, which you will need for renewable energy uh, applications in fuel cells. Congratulations again, uh, Morris and Dan, on the award. Congratulations to your team and good luck on your future endeavors in catalysis. Thanks very much, Chris. We appreciate the honor. Thank you.